to be with today. I'm Paul Blaney. I'm an associate professor of biological engineering at MIT, and my lab is located at the Broad Institute. I'm going to talk about scalable combinatorial screening and a microfluidic platform my group has developed to enable this. I want to start with just a few disclosures before I get into the talk so that everyone can see those. And I'll start by noting how complex biology is. And it's a real triumph of modern biological research that for so many biological systems, we can now identify most of the parts uh, that comprise them. However, we don't yet understand what all those parts do or how they work together in order to support uh, the function of a cell or an organism made up of those cells. And that extends to the influence of environmental factors and drug treatments. Now, we have some really powerful biotechnologies at our fingertips already, but these are typically at their uh, strongest when we're testing one experimental variable at a time, not the large sets of variables that are needed to untangle all these interactions I was just mentioning. And so we really do need new experimental approaches that enable us uh, to manipulate many experimental variables at once. And so that's the uh, purpose of the technology platform uh, based on droplet microfluidics that my group has developed and has been applying to a number of different projects in recent years. Now, I wanna start by introducing microfluidics. Microfluidics is uh, simply uh, the manipulation of fluids at very small scales. So how small? Well, as about a billion or a trillion times smaller than the everyday scale uh, that we're familiar with at home. So your water bottle, if you have one, you know that's gonna be roughly a liter uh, in volume. And that's the kind of volume scale that we're used to working with in our kitchens at home, right? If you fill up a pot of water to boil some pasta, you're gonna be talking about a couple of liters of water. So microfluidics is a, a billion or a trillion times uh, smaller than that. Now, if we go in the other direction, thinking about fluid scales larger than that everyday scale, if we go about the same distance uh, in the other direction, we get up to the scale of oceans, which is a mind-bogglingly large uh, volume scale. We're talking about cubic kilometers uh, in oceans. And so that is to say that the microfluidic scale is as much smaller than the everyday as oceans are larger. Uh, than our uh, every, everyday experience with, with liquids. Now, microfluidics also enter that common daily experience. So for example, an inkjet printer is a pretty sophisticated microfluidic system that can eject uh, a nanoliter or smaller uh, droplets of ink uh, to, to form a printout. We have capillary flows uh, in materials like, uh, like textiles are another example of uh, nanoscopic microfluidic uh, flows in our experience. And of course, as human beings, we ourselves are microfluidic systems and our cardiovascular uh, circulation uh, takes place uh, certainly at a microfluidic scale. Now, I'll introduce here three different classes of microfluidic systems. The first on the left, uh, lab on chip microfluidics. And so these are highly engineered uh, microfluidic uh, devices, which are uh, uh, an analog of microelectronic devices, where chambers and channels and uh, active elements like pumps and valves are microfabricated uh, to form a lab on chip system that can replicate quite complex uh, laboratory processes manipulating uh, molecules and cells. In the middle, uh, I'm showing uh, Microfluidic droplets. Droplets are a distinct class of uh, microfluidics where small uh, aqueous droplets are created in a hydrophobic continuous phase. And it's these droplets that serve as the containers uh, for uh, biochemical processes. One of the distinguishing features of droplet microfluidics is scale. Uh, we can create thousands, uh, even millions of these microfluidic droplets uh, to carry out a lot of processes in parallel. And finally, I want to mention hydrogel microfluidics uh, at the top on the right here. This is an emergent class of microfluidics that's conceptually uh, different. So the idea here is to use an organic 
hydrogel to constrain uh, reaction processes uh, so that we can separate many different reactions in a single phase uh, system. So back to the complexity of biology for a moment, uh, the more we come to understand about how uh, these complex biological networks of molecules and cells work, the stronger uh, the, our hypotheses for how to intervene chemically in those to achieve desired therapeutic outcomes is. But there's a challenge with discovering uh, combinatorial drug treatments. Chemical space is big to begin with. And when we start talking about combinations of uh, chemicals drawn from those spaces, uh, this really becomes an astronomically large and intractable uh, screening problem. So like I mentioned, the droplet microfluidics is uh, about the best we can do for scale. And so is there room to apply that technology uh, to make a dent um, in this uh, combinatorial chemical screening uh, problem? Now, um, there's one major challenge to overcome on our way to, to achieving that. And that's what you see here, uh, which is that drug molecules leak uh, out of one droplet and go into another. And so this uh, basically makes it impossible to maintain a chemical library in droplet form, um, since we would require uh, having a different compound uh, stably associated uh, with, with each droplet. And so you, you see the problem here, you know, as over the course of this movie, the concentration of a dye standing in for a drug molecule equilibrates across uh, each set of seven droplets. But you also see the solution here as well. Now, this group of seven droplets in the middle, which is contained in a sealed microwell pattern in the substrate, is not picking up dye from the adjacent microwells. And so what you're seeing here is now chemical containment, not at the droplet level, but at the microwell level. And so we leverage that to carry out our combinatorial drug screening assays, uh, microwell by microwell. Now, um, a, another requirement for combinatorial screening is that we need to manage the compound consumption. And that's where the miniaturized nature of droplet microfluidics is really handy. In combinatorial screening, each compound is tested uh, not just by itself, but together with many others. And so we need to run a, a lot of different assays with each compound. And those assays need to be microscale in order for the total compound consumption to be manageable. And finally, uh, we really like this microfluidic uh, array uh, approach because the droplets organize themselves into the microwells in order to formulate the combinations we want to test. And so there's no need to program a robot to pick out exactly uh, the uh, combinations that we want to test in each, uh, in each assay. So this movie uh, summarizes uh, the workflow that we've applied for combinatorial drug screening in the droplet microwell system. Each droplet gets a color code identifying its contents. Those are loaded into the microwell array, as you saw. And we can visualize these under the microscope to read the color codes and re-identify each compound. Finally, we merge uh, each set of droplets uh, to formulate the combinatorial assay and then read out uh, uh, cell growth or other uh, cell functional uh, endpoint in order to assess the impact of each set of compounds uh, on the cells. And so this is uh, not only uh, the most efficient uh, combinatorial uh, compound screening system available today. It's also one that's potentially applicable at the point of care for personalized uh, drug screening. Because it's miniaturized and it uh, runs pretty quickly and does not require a large number of cells either, uh, it's potentially suitable uh, for taking cells from an individual patient, running a small drug screen in order to determine which drug therapy is optimal for that individual patient. Now we've pushed this technology into other areas as well. Combinations are important, not just for uh, uh, the drugs, uh, but also for microbes. So in another study, a group of uh, MIT students isolated microbes uh, from soil on campus and elsewhere, and then tested the pairwise interactions of 20 of those isolates across a broad range of 
culture conditions. So this uh, large scale data collection um, together uh, with a new continuous quantitative framework for characterizing the interactions between microbes gave us a bird's eye view of these microbial interactions uh, that was more comprehensive uh, than uh, anyone had carried out before. And so we learned a lot about um, how these microbes interact. And one of the takeaway lessons was that positive interactions between microbes, specifically these where one microbe is uh, benefiting in terms of its growth from the presence of another, are much more common than, is, uh, than is, has really been recognized before. Now, um, uh, in our next study, we upped the ante uh, in terms of these microbial uh, interactions, studying not interactions between a simple pair of microbes, but now looking at interactions among a larger group of microbes and how those contribute to community level functions. So for this work, we built arrays that, uh, that contained larger micro wells able to accommodate a bigger set of droplets. And here we set up a, a toy problem where the community level function we were interested in was the support of the growth of a particular microbe. In this case, uh, Herbis beryllium, a model plant symbiont. So this is the kind of thing you might wanna spray on seeds before you plant them in, uh, in an agricultural application. And so indeed we did find microbial community compositions that supported the growth of Herbis beryllium robustly across a variety of different chemical environments. So that was what we were looking for. It was nice to find it. And even better, we uh, learned a few things about how to build uh, such a community uh, that can support um, a desired function. Now, um, the team was using uh, these large arrays, um, but a postdoc in the group, Sherry Ackerman, decided these arrays weren't even quite big enough. And so she scaled them up further to make what we call MCHIP, our biggest array to date, which contains almost 200,000 uh, microwells, as well as a high density uh, encoding system so that we could encode as many as a thousand inputs uh, to, to, each, um, to, to each screening batch. And so Sherry partnered uh, with Party Sabeti's group to put this scaled up version of the microwell array platform to work uh, in viral diagnostic testing. And so the project focused on scaling up uh, the Sherlock CRISPR based nucleic acid detection chemistry such that we could probe not only for one viral sequence but viral sequences representing all human associated viruses and to do that not just for one clinical sample from a patient but from clinical samples uh, collected from many different patients potentially all in one screening batch and so this uh, work uh, came out fantastically well i think it's a testament to the power of the sherlock uh, chemistry in terms of its specificity and the ease with which new assays can be designed. And earlier this year, uh, this combinatorial testing concept was translated onto a commercial microfluidic device and a smaller panel focused on respiratory viruses was submitted in an emergency use authorization application to FDA. And so we're hoping um, this technology uh, can make a positive impact uh, as we're all uh, working against uh, the COVID pandemic going into the fall. So I'll stop there. Thanks for listening.